I'm diving deep to find out if there's healing power to water. And what does it mean to have a blue mind? The Whanganui River has its own mana within the law that states it's got the same rights as a human. Our ancestors walked feet over these lands, they bathed in these waters. Uh, this was our area where we would bathe, in our area where we would come to heal. I would encourage someone who is around water and has the option to get out there, to get out there. <laughs> that's, that's all I've got. I'm sharing what I've learned filming my documentary series called Health Explored. Along with a small crew, we've circled around the globe, unraveling the different ways health is perceived and achieved across different cultures. My travels have taken me to the towering peaks of Bhutan and to the busy streets of India, across the beautiful landscapes of New Zealand and into the history of Japan. And we just returned from a trip where I learned about climate change and health in the Moroccan Sahara. So I've traveled to over 50 countries and with each stop, my fascination with our world and its people has grown. I love to learn how different societies understand and nurture health. As an academic and explorer at heart, I've always suspected that health expands beyond the narrow box we place around our healthcare system and simply treating sickness, which I think is a common approach here in the West. I know that wellness is more than just being fit and free from stress. It's about thriving and finding happiness in our lives. I wanted to learn how people from around the world cultivate well-being even when they face enormous life challenges and how they find joy in the human experience. And that brings me to today's talk. Now, if you're an alumnus of Memorial, you know that we're surrounded by a cold, rough ocean, where most of the time we're told that it's dangerous and something we should be afraid of. But I've never felt that way. Looking back at my life, I've always had a deep connection with water. I was born in a town on the coast and spent childhood summers at my grandparents' cabin by a river. And the North Atlantic is literally in my backyard. Lots of important moments in my life happened near water. I proposed to my wife by the ocean. I spend spare time in or on water and love to hike along the coast. Water's always held the power to wash away my stress. But is this just me? Or is this bond with water universal to all of us? Now, I've always had an active mind and turning it off can sometimes be hard, but I've always found that water calms it. My first experience with genuinely understanding this was actually through surfing. It was something that would, I would have thought would increase my adrenaline, but instead it was really calming for me. I'd paddle out from the frozen shores of Newfoundland while ice cold waves peaked up in front of me. While the waves came close, I would take a deep breath and force my board down under the water and the cold water would sting my skin. And although it sounds painful, when I come up, I feel alive. When you get out past the breaking waves, you wait and you study the horizon and it's a form of meditation. And then after a while, you might see a perfect wave come your way. Now, catching that wave is sometimes irrelevant. Like, I like the smell of the water, the sound of something familiar, and looking at the coastline in a unique way. It does something incredible for me, and I wanted to find out what that was. And this was how I met Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, author of The Blue Mind. The Blue Mind is a book I found when I was searching whether water is actually good for us, both physically and mentally. It's considered a must read for divers, swimmers, and beachgoers. It explores water's incredible impacts on our mental and physical well being. Now, Dr. Nichols is a marine biologist by trade, and he was the first person to investigate the science behind how being near, in, or underwater can positively influence our physiology and our psychology. So I did what anyone would do and sent him a cold call email on LinkedIn and asked him if he wanted to do an interview. Surprisingly, he responded right away. And a few minutes later, he was talking to me about a trip to Hawaii where he shared the Blue Mind theory with me. Blue Mind is just a name for something that we all know. Anytime you're near, in, on, or underwater, or just thinking about it, or you hear it, you sh your, your mind state shifts, your physiology shifts. So really, Blue Mind is just a, a name for that feeling, that physiological shift that I think all humans have. So here's what I found. First, water reduces our stress. Water triggers a soothing response in our body, leading to a decrease in the stress hormone cortisol. This leads to a calming effect on our nervous system. Now, a lot of people throw around the word cortisol, but I did my PhD in endocrinology, and this is actually the truth. When we reduce our stress hormones, our bodies begin to calm, and water does this for us. 
This is why we take vacations on the beach and love staring at the water or even pay extra for a house with a view of the coast. These are subconscious needs, but our physiology is the driver. Being in or around water improves our mental health. It also leads to a meditative state and fosters a sense of tranquility inside of us. It can reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression. So it's not a cure, but it's a good start. We all know mental health is really complex, but staring at the ocean is a simple and powerful way to give us a different perspective. Now, there's an obvious and important one here, and that is that exercise around water enhances our physical health. Engaging in activities near or in water like swimming or sailing provides physical exercise and improves our cardiovascular health and it strengthens our body. But it's especially powerful for rehab. Just remember what Michael Jordan did during the second year of his career when he broke his ankle. He basically lived in a pool rehabbing it and before long, he was back out on the court. Water also encourages creativity for all those artistic minds out there. Water environments are conducive to creative thinking and problem solving. They enhance cognitive function. It allows the brain to enter into a more innovative and relaxed state. Water can also evoke feelings of awe and wonder, and these are connected to our emotional well-being. These feelings can lead to a greater sense of happiness, fulfillment, and compassion. Lastly, it can provide a sensory restoration. The sound, sight, and sensation of water can serve as a form of sensory therapy, helping to rejuvenate and refresh the mind and body. Now, many of us can relate to some of these effects, if not all of them, and if you have, you've actually experienced a blue mind for yourself. So hopefully you can relate, and you know that feeling is believing. But I'm also a believer that seeing is believing. So I went to the culture that may value the health benefits of water the most of anywhere else in the world, New Zealand. Now my first stop was to meet with the team at an association called Live For More. At Live For More, the power of water takes on a whole new meaning. Maori youth battering the challenges of life, whether it's gangs, crime, or addiction, find strength and lessons in the waves. These young men can tap into their potential through surf therapy and empower a new way of life. Youth are invited to join the program and experience firsthand water therapy's incredible impacts on their lives. Now, the first person that we met was the youth navigator named Jared Dixon, and he's the one leading that circle. He wasn't always the head counselor. He once participated in the program. When Jared's life took a challenging turn, it led him to encounters with the law and spending time in jail. And he recognized he needed a change in his life. He embraced a new path through the Live For More Surf Therapy program. The power of the ocean altered his entire course of his life. Now, he was drawing from deep cultural connections as a Maori person. He found healing and personal growth outside of the formal medical and rehabilitation system. Jared now mentors new students and plays an integral role in running the Live For More program. Through his experience, Jared learned the incredible potential for healing and transformation within the embrace of the ocean. Now, surfing was chosen for a reason as their form of water therapy at Live For More. Firstly, many of these boys came from financially challenged households and surfing is an expensive sport that many of them never tried. But what's most important is that surfing beautifully represented these boys' challenges. Now, regardless of the ocean conditions, they had to go in the water as a group, rain or shine, clean, small waves or rough, big, messy ones. They had to face their fears. They also use surfing as a metaphor for life. Sometimes you can wipe out and sometimes you can struggle, but you have to get back up because every once in a while you catch that perfect wave and it's all worth it. Life is like that and water helps us realize that. You know, there's a saying that says there's no mountain without a valley and likewise, there's no wave without a trough. But no matter how deep that trough is, you can always make it to the top of the wave. Just ask Jared. I was stuck in that path, in that destructive lifestyle. You know, I, I never thought I'd get out of it, you know. But it, it's just, you know, hard work and knowing that anything's possible, you know. You can get through it, you can change your life, you can turn things around. Um, no matter how far you're, you're in it, no matter how deep you're in this, you know, darkness, you know, you can come out and you can change. Live For More is a powerful reminder about the strength we can find in community. Water brought them together to face their challenges. There's also a really deep cultural connection between the Maori and water, which makes it so much more important in New Zealand. Long ago in the vastness of Tiamuana Nui Akiwa, or some people call the Pacific Ocean, a remarkable journey unfolded. It was a voyage that spanned thousands of miles guided by the stars and the currents of the sea. This is the story 
of how the ancestors of the Maori people arrived in the land they now call Aotearoa, or New Zealand. The Maori were brave ocean travelers and had seven canoes known as waka, and they cut through the waves with skill. Their hearts were filled with determination as they set out on their voyage, leaving Polynesia behind in search of new horizons. And for weeks they sailed across the ocean, using the stars to chart their course. Guided by their unwavering connection to the water, they pressed forward, undeterred by tempests and the dangers that they encountered. Under the watchful eye of Tangaroa, who's their god of the sea, their boats had reprieved from the storms and the travelers found solace in the ocean. The waters reminded them that they were never alone. And after a difficult journey, the Maori reached their new land, drawing upon their ancestral connection and knowledge to form vibrant communities known as iwi. To this day, water remains intertwined with Maori life and culture. It's not just a resource, but it's a tonga, a treasure that holds deep significance. But what I didn't realize when I started looking at water and its role in health in New Zealand is that it's almost like an archaeologist seeing something in the sand. At first, it might be small and barely visible, but as you start to dig, you find an entire relic hidden just below the surface. I started by looking at water, but it turned out to be so much more. To the Maori, water is only part of the equation. When it comes to health, they believe in a fascinating philosophy I think we could all learn from. It's called Ti Wara Tapa Wa. This model compares health to our Western perspective, but it's much different. It says that health is like a meeting house with four walls. Health, physical, mental health, family, and spiritual health. So imagine the four walls are each represented by a dimension. This model was developed by leading Maori health advocate Sir Mason Jury in 1984 and emphasizes the balance and interconnectedness of these aspects of overall well-being. Now, the first dimension represents physical health. In Maori philosophy, the body is seen as a vessel that carries us through life and is caring for it is essential. This involves not just the absence of illness, but the active maintenance through physical activities like traditional games and dances you may have seen like the haka. These activities are more than just exercise. They're a way to connect with the land, community, and heritage, and they reinforce the importance of physical well-being in a more holistic sense than maybe our common perspective of going for a workout. Now, next is mental and emotional health. This aspect focuses on how we think and how we feel and how we communicate. It's not just about the absence of mental illness, but also possessing a healthy mind that maintains balanced thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. In Maori culture, the mind and body are inseparable, and mental health is nurtured through practices like meditation, storytelling, and being in harmony with nature. Now, the third element is all about family health. The Maori believe health is deeply connected to the social environment, particularly to our families. This dimension emphasizes the strength of and the health of relationships of relatives and our community. It teaches that everyone has a role, and a healthy community contributes to an individual's well-being. Activities like shared meals and storytelling strengthen these bonds. And finally, there's spiritual health. And I think this is the most distinct aspect of the model. It's about connection to our beliefs, to our values, and to our heritage. It encompasses practices like uplifting the spirit and having connection to ancestral land. It's about understanding one's place in the world and continuing cultural practices. The deep sense of spirituality is fundamental to overall well-being in Maori culture. But another critically important thing is the underlying role of the environment. And when I asked why water was so important to our Maori guide and knowledge holder, Tuopatama from Hanana Media, he said this. If the context of the world that you live in doesn't support the notion of you protecting water, then how are you gonna survive? How will you survive if you don't have water? So the question would be then, what can you do for water rather than what can water do for you? Because we need each other to survive in the world. And once we remove our, mm, our sense of ownership of things, then we can live a lot more harmoniously. Now, we left Auckland and we wound through roads for hours. There was a massive mountain range we had to cross until we came to the coast. Here, the setting sun painted a breathtaking canvas. We parked our vehicle on the roadside and were greeted by an incredible sight. The sky was crimson, and there was a gigantic Taranaki volcano that commanded the horizon. 
The sea stretched out forever in front of us and was laced with ribbons of western swell. The ocean breeze was gentle and warm and it carried the unmistakable scent of salt water and it reminded me of home. We were immersed in a blue mind state almost immediately and realized why the locals affectionately call this place Teradice. Now the next day, we began with a short drive from the town of New Plymouth to a local surf break where our new friends warmly welcomed us at a beach house filled with bright blue beginner surfboards and happy faces. Now, this is the first time I met a man named Hayden Thorpe, but we had been talking on email and Zoom for months leading up to the trip. And it was a pretty incredible experience to meet him face to face because it was his story about how they use water to heal and rehabilitate people that ignited our idea to travel so extensively around the world for the show. He introduced me to his coworkers and participants of this program that he called Restoke. Now, their philosophy combines the stoke of surfing with one-on-one -on -one counseling, support, and therapeutic practices both in and out of the water. Participants are chosen through a competitive application process in which they express why they believe water and surfing can unlock their hidden potential. The program's success has earned it international recognition, but I can tell you that Restoke remains grounded in its mission to help one person at a time. It values the restorative power of the ocean and is dedicated to fostering growth, resilience, and self-discovery. Through Restoke, Hayden and his team encourage participants to confront their challenges head-on, and he provides them with a safe and supportive space where healing qualities of water can be harnessed to their fullest potential. Now, I met with some of the participants over the next few hours, and we sat together one-on-one, -on -one, and they shared their stories. And I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of my travel. I don't know if you've had many conversations with perfect strangers where you stare into their eyes for like a half an hour and ask them a ton of personal questions, but it forms a bond with them and it's an incredible privilege to experience. The first person I chatted with was called Nick. Now, Nick was a former competitive surfer and a construction worker in his 20s. He had a distinctive new school mullet and looked the part of lost his passion for his favorite sport and for life in general. Now, working in construction, he feared judgment and lacked a safe space to express his mental health vulnerabilities. And I think this is quite common in industry. I worked in oil and gas for years, and I know that many workers struggle with mental health quietly and are ashamed to come forward. No one can live up to an unrealistic image of strength. Now, Nick's path crossed with Hayden through their tight-knit surf community. And following a surf session, he approached Hayden saying, I know you have a program to help people. I need a shakeup, and I need someone to talk to. His involvement in Hayden's program didn't just end with his recovery. He ended up staying on, offering peer support, and embodying the virtues of empathy and community that Restoke is based on. His story mirrors the internal battles that many people face with mental health. The external facade of strength often hides inner turmoil and a struggle that's too familiar for many people. Nick's courage of embracing his vulnerabilities and seeking help marks a crucial step in mental health advocacy. His journey also highlights that our fears of vulnerability are often more about our own insecurities than other people's judgments. If you can have a few things in your life that just help you, like, oh, that's all right. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna crack it. I'm gonna do well this week. Um, you know, I might just eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for, <laughs> for a week, and, and I might argue with my wife, but then we'll make up, and it's gonna be awesome, and it's gonna be beautiful. But that's like life. That's raw living, and and. I don't think there's any, any use in protecting ourselves from those things. Those things are uncomfortable, but those things are also brilliant. Um, yeah. Now, Restoke and his program testify the importance of open conversations about mental health. It reminds us that strength isn't just about facing challenges on our own, but acknowledging our struggles and seeking help within a community. The next person I met was Moana, a peace and person of deep spiritual depth and resilience. She's named after the Maori word for ocean, and her Aboriginal heritage and extensive exploration of life have shaped her as a mother with a deep understanding of life's complexities. She had initially hesitated to join the Restoke program because she grappled with guilt and unworthiness, believing that others might be more deserving of the opportunity. But as the program unfolded, Moana found peace in the rhythm of the ocean. I remember watching her. She was guided by Hayden as she navigated through the rough white water to a place of calm beyond the break. There, she floated peacefully and was she was the happiest when she was in this position. She slowly created a new perspective on life, not concerned about catching waves, but instead enjoying the harmony that only the ocean could impart. This was a ritual that symbolized her journey from turmoil to tranquility. Now, through her experience with the ocean, Moana began to see the world through a different lens. She discovered an intense harmony and an undeniable healing power from the ocean. This revelation wasn't just about finding peace, it was about reclaiming freedom, a freedom that allowed her to connect deeply with her namesake, the ocean. 
Now, her willingness to confront self-doubt and prioritize her own well-being wasn't just a personal victory. Her growth enabled her to be more present and supportive for those around her, especially for her children. I think what Moana teaches us is invaluable. Her initial feelings of guilt followed by the acceptance and embrace of self-care underscore the profound impact of looking after ourselves. Moana's story is a testament to the transformative power of self-care. It's a reminder that taking care of ourselves isn't selfish at all, but can be a necessary step to be the best we can for those that depend on us. Her journey is an inspiring narrative highlighting how self-care can enhance our ability to nurture and to support others. Like the ocean, it can be an absolute crazy storm. <laughs> and then other days it can just be really beautiful and calm and that's life and we get to enjoy those moments, all of it, to actually honour being human. So the Blue Mind isn't just about staring at the ocean or surfing, it's about something bigger than ourselves. It's a place that restores us, it's powerful. And I think many of us realise this during the pandemic when the sea, the pond, the river or whatever was a place we could turn to. So how do you get a dose of the Blue Mind? Well, it's called giving yourself a blue scription. First, you can get active in water. Schedule regular time for water-based activities like swimming, kayaking, paddleboarding, or even walking or hiking close to the beach, which we can do here very easily in Newfoundland. Next, create a relaxing water ritual. Set a time, time each day to take a soothing bath, enjoy a hot shower, or practice mindfulness near water. This could be a fountain or a shoreline. Use this dedicated time to relax and reflect and let go of your daily stresses. You can also use water for rehabilitation. You can incorporate aquatic exercise in your fitness routine, remembering the buoyancy of water reduces the impact on joints and make it an ideal option for people with joint pains or injuries. You can also calm your mind with water. Try to seek out natural water environments such as lakes, rivers, and oceans. Plan outings to these locations like in picnics or walks or to enjoy the calming sights and sounds of the water. And if you can't get near natural water, buy a small fountain for your home or even download an app that offers soothing sounds of waves, rivers, or rain. You gotta remember we are water, so we have to drink an adequate amount of water throughout the day to maintain hydration. So carry a reusable water bottle as a reminder to drink more water regularly, but you also be looking after yourself and preventing plastic from entering our oceans. Now throughout my journey to New Zealand's shores, I experienced water's transformative power. From the healing properties of the thermal pool to the support found in surf therapy, I was really lucky to witness firsthand the incredible impact water can have on our well-being. It cleanses our minds and it offers us comforts in times of stress. It connects us to something bigger than ourselves. Water provides an environment where we can be resilient, a place where individuals can discover strength and rewrite their stories. So when I look out the familiar coastline of our home, I realize the healing power of water doesn't have boundaries. It weaves us together with a shared bond. There's a universal connection with water and it's profound. Water can heal and it's all around us. I hope this journey has inspired you to find your water. Thanks very much. Wow, Mike, thank you for that incredibly informative session. Before we jump into the Q&A, I want to take a couple of moments to thank our sponsors for today's event. Johnson Insurance is now Bel Air Direct, and they continue to offer Memorial University alumni specially designed policies and preferred rates on home, auto, and travel insurance. Memorial is appreciative of the support that Bel Air Direct provides to our students through work terms, graduate hires, scholarships, and more. You can find more information on the alumni engagement website. Manulife can offer you new or supplemental life, health, and dental insurance. This recently added program for alumni is something you might want to check out. Find them again on the Mun Alum website. Now, we'll jump into the Q&A. Just so you know, I'm going to stick around in the background and feed Mike some questions. So you're still going to hear my voice. But for now, the camera is going to focus on Mike for the rest of the session. Okay, Mike, we have a question here from Lynn who asks, is there a difference if the water is in a hot or cold climate? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So you look outside and see snow here. And, you know, the thing that Dr. Nichols shared with us was really interesting was that water in all of its form gives us a sense of awe. So that could be a snowstorm, it could be a waterfall, it could be a simple little fountain. Um, warm water, there's lots of benefits to being in a warm climate, but I think that there isn't anything more magical than staring at our freezing cold ocean in the middle of the spring when the icebergs are rolling in. So I think that water in general is something that's extremely therapeutic for us. I've seen the benefits here in the cold. 
we've been all the way up to Nain, where the ocean is frozen and it becomes a livelihood for the people in, in that area. We've also been to the warm waters of places like New Zealand. Um, I don't know if it really matters as much. I think it's that it gives us a sense of familiarity with something like home uh, and, and offers us a sense of calm, whether we can get in it or just stare at it. Great, thanks for that. Um, David is joining us from the prairies and he mm -hmm. says, we're even a, um, can you give them some tips uh, for people who live in the prairies where it's, it's hard to find a small pond or a stream? Um, what would you suggest to help foster this connection to water? Mm -hmm. And we actually addressed the same question with the author. And he said, you know, it is as simple as the app or even thinking about it, having it on your TV screen. We've all seen those stations with the beach view on that. That actually does make a difference. What happens when we get anywhere exposed to it? And this could be a shower or a bath with the door closed and quiet is that our physiology changes, our skin cools, our heart rate drops, our stress hormones drop. And so getting it in any form you can is powerful. And maybe in a place like the prairies, we don't have as much of it. You might have to go to non-natural sources, but having that access, whether it be the tub, whether it be the app, whether it be the fountain in the house, whether it be watching it even on TV, these are all things that can that can assist with it. And I think that you know, you're, you're not exposed to it as much, so it might even have a more profound impact when you do get it. Thanks. Um, Andrea says, such helpful information. Thank you, Mike. Having visited over 50 countries, in what ways have you noticed the manifestation of the blue mind across different cultures? And are there universal aspects or unique variations you've observed? That's a really interesting question. Um, a couple of things that really stand out to you is that in almost all cultural or spiritual traditions, water is part of it. You know, water is part of creation. Water is part of life, right? And it's essential for all of us. So I think that no matter where I've been, water has been extremely important. A thing that really stands out to me was literally less than a week ago, I got back from the Sahara and Morocco is facing huge challenges when it comes to drought and water. It's the rainy season there and there was rivers that were normally 200 feet wide that were little creeks and it's affecting food and, and the way of life of people. And we met nomads and the nomads that we met used to follow the rain and they would go to different parts of the Sahara or the desert or the topography of Morocco based on where the rain was. Uh, but they couldn't travel anymore because there wasn't as much rain in their region and they actually had to have water brought to them. And so when I look at its role, there's a couple of different roles. There's the spiritual role, there's the cultural role, there's the survival role. But I think that there's not a culture in the world that doesn't rely heavily on water. And one more example I'll give you again is up in Nain, where the ice becomes a road. And when that ice isn't frozen because of climate change and different things and changes with the water, it completely and drastically changes their way of life. Great. Now, this one isn't a comment or sorry, isn't a question, but is more of a comment. Kathy notes that you've answered her questions or her thoughts about um, why she seeks out water just as part of her every day. So I think that's really neat. It's it's really is a universal thing. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen would like to know, have you explored any connections to blue zone research in relation to your own endeavors with the blue mind? Yes, so we went to Okinawa last year, and this is all something they can watch on the TV show where we looked at uh, longevity with some of the oldest people in the world, in particular, the oldest women in the world. Uh, we looked at purpose. Uh, we were actually working with some of the people from the Blue Zones, uh, Dan Butner's team, who helped coordinate uh, some of our aspects of our trip there. We went to Costa Rica this year, and we worked with the Zona Azul Association, which is the Blue Zones Association there. We met who person who might be the fittest person in the world for their age. His name is Ramiro, and he is a rancher who, at 102 years old, can jump up on a horse in a matter of seconds and herd 50 cows down a road. It's an Pretty incredible story. He works every day from 5 a.m. until noon and then goes back to the farm after lunch. Um, that was amazing. And uh, this year we're going to go to Sardinia and we're going to be looking at the blue zone in Sardinia and how the marine climate, the pasture climate, and the mountain climate all lead themselves to uh, a form of longevity because of the foods they eat, the activity they get, and the culture that they have. So the blue zones are fascinating. And what we found with this was that the blue zones are special because these are historical ways of living. But what we may find in the future is there's new blue zones that emerge where best practices are taken from these different cultures and applied in the community that's really dead set on living healthy. And one of the reasons that we do what we do here and with Memorial 
Florida University is a supporter of our efforts, is that we hope to take some of these global practices in health, especially the ones that are really applicable, like the Blue Mind to Newfoundland and Labrador, and help our population, which we all know has huge challenges when it comes to health, to be able to incorporate some of these best practices so that we can move the needle and we can become a society with better longevity, quality of life, and health. Thanks for that. All right, Nadine would like to know, um, can you make any comments on the benefits of swimming in a chlorinated pool, or is, are there any costs of exposure to swimming in a chlorinated uh, water versus natural water? Yeah, so that would get a little bit outside of my realm. The way I look at things for most people is physical activity in any form is really, really good. There's obviously better ways of exposing ourselves to different, uh, you know, different aspects like a natural environment versus one that's a synthetic environment where there might be chemicals in the water i'm not sure about any repercussions of swimming in a pool but i do know that regular exercise and swimming in particular has incredible health benefits for us great for our cardiovascular system like i said easy on our joints it's social activity uh it's fun you know so there's there's a lot of benefits that way but i can't speak to whether or not there's a specific challenge when it comes to chlorine i would just say physical activity is something that a lot of us lack and a lot of us don't get enough of so any way we can get it is better than not getting it at all all right, Tony is joining us from Treaty 8 territory, which is along the banks of two rivers in Fort McMurray. Tony's wondering, would you recommend when available to connect with indigenous elders to share their traditions of these rivers? 1 million percent. Uh, one of the most enlightening things that we've done, we've traveled is to talk to the indigenous population, in particular the Maori in this in this topic. Uh, they were so helpful in helping us understand the bigger picture in the whole equation, right? Like, so how the health of our planet impacts the health of a person. You know, we are so reliant on water. We're so reliant on our environment. And a lot of these cultures have incredible practices that help preserve and respect these environments. And I think any opportunity you have to learn from people with a different perspective than yourself is a valuable one. And, uh, you know, the second we start to think that we know everything, then that's the second we stop being curious and stop learning. And the reason I've done this whole you know, approach and going around the world and, and talking with different communities and cultures, because I came from a very, you know, I came from an education background, I had a PhD in medicine. So I've learned all about the textbook physiology. But when I look at our communities, we're struggling with so many health challenges, even though we, we can avail of, of healthcare and science and things like this. And I feel like there was something more. And so the entire conversation was about me learning from different opinions and learning at different approaches that may not be used in day to day life where we live, but could be highly applicable. So I think curiosity is key, especially with people that are knowledge holders with tradition like that. Thank you. Um, another one here in speaking with the folks from Aotearoa, did the topic of water rights or environmental justice come up, for example, protecting water sources and access to clean water? I love this question. This is the best question because I have the most incredible answer for this. The, the Maori people uh, believe that nature is part of their family, that the water is their older brother or sister and the planet is their mother and this heaven is the is their father. Um, and there's a river in New Zealand that's actually been granted the same rights as a human which means that if you pollute it or you damage it or you take advantage of it, it's like assaulting a human. And so this is the first of its kind in the world where these human rights have been given to a form of nature. And it's absolutely incredible. And every year uh, there's a certain group that will go up in canoes and they'll connect not only with themselves while they go up as a group in, the, in their wakas, but they actually end up connecting with their older brother, which is the river itself. And so preservation of that is extremely important. So that was that was a really, really interesting uh, part of the whole thing. And also the way that they introduce themselves, they introduce themselves by here's our body of water here's our canoe here's our village and here's our mountain and it was just fascinating to see how their entire identity was linked to the environment around them and water was a huge part of that and that's why we went there because they probably have the the most healthy attitude when it comes to water in particular the maori people wow thanks for sharing that monica would like to know how do you see the blue mind theory apply to marine conservation and enhancing a deeper sense of care for the sea I wish I could say this as well as Dr. Nichols does, but if you check out our episode on this, you can hear him say that. And that is that when we start to think about water, whether it be the ocean or rivers or lakes, 
as being something that's fundamentally crucial to our survival, we'll start to take care of it more. Right, so we can see it as something that we need to drink to survive. We can see it as something that's part of our body. But when we start to see it as something that heals us and restores us and helps us live a better life, that's when we start to make a big difference. And featuring stories like New Zealand and what they're doing, the reason we do this is so that other people can watch it and they can start to apply this because what they're doing isn't impossible to do anywhere else. They just decided to do it where they are. So by learning about other things, seeing examples where they're putting conservation at the forefront allows communities like ours or Canada or anywhere else in the world to start to apply these same principles. And if we all do that, that'll make a difference. I mean, you think about a glass of water, every drop of water in that glass is the same size, same importance and same significance, but it only takes one to make the whole thing overflow. Every community has to start putting drops of water into that glass in order for us to have a healthy water ecosystem in the world. Excellent. All right, we have Ken with us, who is an active scuba diver, mm. instructor, and underwater photographer since 1992, wow. and he has thousands of dives underneath his belt. He also agrees with you on how time on, in, and under the water has beneficial effects to overall health. Yeah. He's curious if there's any research on the differences between the effects of around, on top of, or under the water. I don't know, to be honest with you, but I could only imagine that being under the water as a scuba diver and something that you love and doing it that much would be extremely um, powerful. I've done my scuba diving, so is Braden, our director, uh, and uh, we've been down under the water where there's quiet and dark and there's a whole different perspective on, on, on the world. And so I think that just that unique aspect of being in a world that's completely different than ours would even make a greater impact. I can't speak to it per se, um, but I would assume that number one, if it's something you love, that's going to make a huge difference because you're a hundred percent in and you're engaged. Uh, and number two, the fact that it's such a unique environment and I'm guessing the things you've seen, if you've done that many dives are just absolutely fascinating. Um, that would be another whole level to it, you know, for, for everybody else, get a snorkel and go for a snorkel. Fantastic. Look at the water. If that's all you can do, because it might be too cold and you might not be comfortable getting into it. But yes, I'm sure that somebody like you who's dedicated their life to it has an even greater effect from it. Thanks. Chris is wondering what role do government and current practitioners play in moving society towards more of this type of mental health practice versus traditional drug therapy? Totally. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that they're doing as a result of this Blue Mind book is these blue scriptions. They're actually a thing. And they're starting to work with medical schools to promote non-medicinal, non-therapeutic or traditional therapeutic uh, modalities like being in and around water. Um, this is something that's moving forward more and more all the time. You also see initiatives like the One Health Initiative, which we're actually rolling at Memorial University, that looks at how our health is responsible for um, our decisions around the environment, for example. So how the environment impacts us. I see there's a greater appreciation more and more for some of the non-traditional medical approaches to this because, number one, there's no harm in it. There's no byproduct. There's no side effect from it other than you get out and look at the ocean. And so I think that there's a greater appreciation. But there's also two sides to that. There has to be an uptake from the person that's being prescribed that to do that. So half of the, the, the challenge is getting people to prescribe it. The other half is getting people to do it. And that's why when we do our show, we decided to do a documentary that highlights beautiful places and incredible stories because we want people to actually watch it. And while they're watching it, hopefully they learn something. Because when you have an appreciation for something, when you have an understanding for it and somebody tells you to do it, the likelihood of you actually following through on it is greater, and that's where the real benefit lies. So you can't force somebody to do it. People have to want to do it, and that's what we hope talks like this help inspire people to do. All right, we have another question from Andrea here. She's curious, how can post-secondary institutions intentionally introduce more exposure to water or blue zones for our students? Have you introduced this concept of the blue mind to medical students who can help advance this messaging? Yeah, okay. So I'll take the first one is that there's so many different ways. In particular, I think about Memorial University. You know, we've got a, a marine biology department. We've got an ocean science center. There's so many different ways that we can forge an appreciation for this within the sciences, within psychology, which in social work, there's so many different ways because we have this resource around us. And this is why I wanted to go to New Zealand because New Zealand is a lot like Newfoundland and the fact that we're surrounded by ocean. 
you know, we have similar demographics in our population and, uh, and they're seeing a huge benefit and we haven't quite harnessed that yet. So that's the first thing. There's lots of different disciplines that can engage into this and there is real science behind it. Um, the second thing is, are we engaging MUN medical students with this? Yes. The medical school, of course, has our traditional education, which we focus on because these have to be these students have to be trained as physicians. But there's a ton of different uh, groups within the student body. So there's the MUNMED Adventure Group, which I'm a co-chair of from the faculty side of things, uh, as well as student wellness. And so they use these groups to help. Uh, reinforce positive behaviors. For example, they do a thing called Hills for Humanity every year where the medical classes go up and down the hill uh, for the entire month uh, of Signal Hill. They overlook the ocean, they go for a hike, and then they raise money for a good cause. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. As well, there is more education coming through about One Health and how the link between our planetary health and our, and our personal health. So I think it's it's well on its way, which I'm really excited to see. Great, thank you. Now, the next question might be a little bit tricky. Okay. Um, have you come across any regions that used to be blue zone, mm. but aren't anymore, and why that changed? Almost all of them are starting to decline in their blue zone status. Um, when we were in Okinawa, uh, Okinawa is a very isolated island, several hours off the coast of mainland Japan. And so, for a while, it was very uh, close-knit. Uh, travel in and out was challenging. The foods were very specific to the region. It's what they could grow because they didn't have airplanes and all sorts of transportation. So when we look at this population of a hundred and some year old individuals, centenarians, uh, they've been around for a long time and the world has changed dramatically since then. In that blue zone in particular, they're seeing there's massive increases in diabetes and heart disease and cancers and things that are related to lifestyle and the foods that may be more processed and the challenges that we face here in Canada and in Newfoundland in particular. Uh, also in Costa Rica, things have changed. Um, the access to, again, refined foods and the change in the way crops are grown are all making a difference. One of the reasons that they credit, and I have to check the source on this, but in uh, Costa Rica, they think that one of the reasons why Nicoya was such a, a epicenter for longevity was there wasn't a lot of fertilizers and pesticides used in their crops. And now the foods they get may be more from a traditional farming uh, type tool. So what they're finding is there's very, these, these blue zones are under fire and uh, trying to conserve and, and sort of fight off the challenges that almost all societies are facing are unique. Uh, and uh, they're, they're definitely dominant. But what was really encouraging, we spoke to Dr. Richard Alsop from the University of Hawaii, was that, and he wrote part of the book on the Okinawa program, was that we can take those best practices. And if we create values around health and we, we hold it in esteem within our communities, we can start to adopt these things. And one of the things I'm really proud of in Newfoundland and Labrador is we've acknowledged the challenges we have in health <clears throat> and we're placing a value to become the, the healthiest province in the country at some point. Right now, we're not there, but at least the value is being instilled in people that health is important and we need to start taking steps towards it. And that's when new blue zones could be created. Thanks, Mike. We have Marilyn joining us today, and Marilyn is a teacher who understands the value of encouraging children to drink water when they're upset or stressed. She's curious, is water in any form used with addiction care? I have never heard that before for addiction. Um, I will say that I don't think you can name one prescription for health it doesn't include drinking lots of water. Okay, uh, water makes us feel better. Why, like I, one thing I can talk about, so addiction, food addiction. I did my PhD in obesity. I looked at hormones associated with obesity. And the number one confusion for our body and our brain when it comes to hunger is we think we're hungry when we're actually thirsty. So for example, craving food for food addiction, drinking lots of water helps our stomach stay full and satiated and keeps us away from some of these refined sugars. So that's something that's really big, um, at least on the food addiction side. And there's been, Lots of studies out there, some of which came from Dr. Sun's lab here at Memorial that show that our addiction to food can be as strong as addiction to heroin in some people. So it's a big, big challenge. So yes, water could definitely be used when it comes to healthy lifestyles to avoid food addiction. When it comes to other types of addiction, that's not really my wheelhouse, but I would say it's part of a healthy lifestyle for everybody. I think that's a great idea to give it to kids when they get animated though. Awesome. We also have Jennifer with us, uh, who is now in Toronto, but who is a Newfoundlander. She's always believed that Newfoundlanders have what she calls an East Coast sensibility to life 
and it's rooted in how growing up next to the ocean changes how you think about life. She says your talk really helped confirm that idea for her. What spoke to her was letting go of this idea of ownership of water. Mm. So how do we begin to change our thinking around this, especially when the idea of ownership comes up with connotations of privilege? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I think about the fact that if the planet, and again, I was never an environmentally, like I was always environmentally conscious, but I wasn't somebody who was like very environmentally um, uh, socially oriented. But the more I've traveled, the more I've seen, uh, the more I realize that, you know, it is one planet. It's not just like, it's not a province or a, a town or a country even. It's the entire world has to take an approach towards conserving water. Uh, I never realized until I traveled how few places have clean drinking water to the point that all of us have gotten sick on our travels in different places because we can't drink the water. We can't eat a salad because it might be washed in certain foods. And these are challenges that a lot of people face. They face them here in Canada. They face, but they face them around the world. And so um, I think that we have to start looking at the, the world as like, we are related to that with our health. Um, we're related to it with, with things like even the air pollution and things like this. So as soon as we start to shift that perspective, that'll make a difference. But also, when it comes to political decisions, we have to remember that it's people that vote these folks in. And so us being aware of what's important to us and having our own platforms that, that we want to support, um, that allows us to put people in place that will change the policies that we think are important, regardless of what your views are. So I think that's an important concept. Great. Thank you. That seems to be the last of the questions that we have. That's a lot of good today. questions. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Rapid fire. I hope I did okay. <laughs> thank you for answering all of those for us yeah. today. And thank you for the participants. Oh, we have one more. Okay. okay. Let's have your last question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. <laughs> Uh, just a caveat a lot of the questions too is that this comes from a form of curiosity again i've got a specialty in one aspect of medicine but it's always a smaller aspect this this is, comes from curiosity and, and meeting people so this is my perspective it is okay kelly i'm not seeing your question come in um i'll give it a couple more minutes but i'll i'll just extend my thanks to mike again for joining us today and sharing all of that thoughtful presentation with us um, everyone, I want to make note to mark in your calendars that episode two, Journey to Mindfulness, is scheduled for February 20th. Uh, registrations will open up two weeks prior to that. An email will be sent out. So I really hope all of you will join us again on, on February 20th for episode two. As indicated, this session has been recorded and we will share a link in um, an email. So please keep your eyes on your inbox. Um, okay, Kelly's question has come in. She yes. says, or sorry, they say, you mentioned groups at MUN. What thoughts do you have for us student programming for wellness as the lead? Yeah, so uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm assuming Kelly is associated with the student programming. Um, I would say there's a couple of great initiatives people can do. Number one, physical activity by the ocean, East Coast Trail. Every spring we need it cleaned up, every year we need it maintained. What a great way to get out with people. It's team building, it's nature. You get to discover new parts of our beautiful province. So that would be a number one thing. Other thing, our beaches. You know, we have really clean beaches here compared to some parts of the world, but we had gone down to Bergio this year, which is one of the most beautiful archipelagos of islands you're gonna find anywhere in the world. And we dove down uh, to our scuba dive friend who asked a question before, and we pulled lots of garbage out of the ocean. And it was really sad to see that. So, um, Cleanup projects, fantastic physical activity challenges, things where you're doing relays or, or anything that's going to have some social impact outside of just a physical activity, all really, really good. And the other thing is when stressful exams come up, like we have tons of students that are going through this, both in undergrad and the medical school, it's a, it's a great stress reliever. So, you know, pay attention to what we said today. I do it all the time. I live right by the ocean. When I'm having a hard day, I go down to the ocean and I take a deep breath and I smell that water. And, and we know, in particular, if you are from here and you get back home, you smell that salt water and it just calms you down. Take the extra time to go do what Moana did for self-care. Prioritize your own self-care, especially as a student when you're going through new challenges for the first time. And by prioritizing that, you're probably going to end up doing way better and saving time in the long run by taking time to take care of yourself. Great. Thank you, Mike. Once again, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today.
I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day and we'll see you again on February 20th.